flu is certainly where I started. Well, flu and RSV at, at Vanderbilt, um, with many people well known to this group, Barney Graham, Kathy Edwards worked with Jan a lot. I always say, um, flu is both exasperating and, and good job security because, um, I, we are unlikely to solve the, the problem of influenza in my lifetime. And I put a little sub bullet on here that it, it's all about context and we'll talk about that as I go along. So uh, as with many of, of the speakers, you know, it's hard to cover this complex topic in 25 minutes. So I've, I've chosen some areas to highlight, but I certainly invite questions or comments at the end about the, the broader field of, of influenza. So I'm going to describe a bit about the unique challenges of influenza and influenza vaccines, which are perhaps not quite so unique now that coronavirus is around. You'll see some similarities there. And then really talk about context. How might these programs differ in low and high resource settings? Um, so here's a picture of the virus. You can decide if it's more or less beautiful than HPV, but, but I kind of like the influenza virus. Uh, you can see there it's a segmented RNA virus, which is really important, um, as we'll talk about, because those gene segments are, are readily traded between viruses. We're most concerned with those two surface proteins, the hemagglutinin and, and the neuraminidase, and that's how we get H1N1 and H3N2 and H7N3 and, and all of, of the other viruses that we have. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these unique characteristics, but, but influenza is really everywhere. It infects multiple species. We're not going to use the words elimination and eradication for a virus like this that is, is quite far from being exclusively human. Now, the current influenza vaccines are based on circulating viruses, and you can see the degree of change over time. And so this is really quite problematic because this looks at about the last 15 years and how frequently we have to have strain changes in the influenza vaccine. So it's this inherent characteristic of influenza to have this constant genetic evolution. And also, influenza viruses can, can reassort, and then we get into major changes. And that's how we get the H5s and the H10s and, and uh, the, um, the non-human viruses. And you can see here that, that humans share receptors with, with pigs. We don't share receptors with birds, but pigs share receptors with, with both. Some people refer to pigs as a mixing vessel, but it's certainly possible, as you've heard about actually unprecedented avian influenza right now, outbreaks in, in domestic poultry, in wild birds, and then of course, infections of, of humans in, in Russia, China, perhaps one, one can case in, in the U.S. So this happens, it happens regularly, it happens frequently, and it's only when these viruses are viable because of this exchange of genetic material and, and transmissible that we really have a problem. And the last big problem we had was in 2009, and, and to me, this is just a beautiful slide that makes my point that this reassortment is happening all the time. And when you trace back that influenza virus and the origins of the 2009 virus, you can see here um, that there was originally a triple reassortant, then an additional re reassortment with that neuraminidase and, and M protein with these reassortments in, occurring from birds to, to pigs, from or from ducks to pigs, from ducks to humans to, to back to pigs, and then ultimately having a virus that was transmitted to humans and transmitted between humans. So what do we know about human clinical influenza? I don't have a lot of time to go through this. Um, it, it's an acute febrile respiratory illness and influenza-like illness. The usual definition is, is fever or feverishness with cough and or sore throat. 
but we know there are many other manifestations and we know you find what you look for. So if you're looking for this definition, that is what you'll find. And I'll show you some data later where when we start to look more broadly, we find that influenza causes broader symptomatology. Certainly has more serious pulmonary manifestations. You know, we think of croup as associated with parainfluenza, for example. But when you do diagnostic testing, influenza can cause croup, can cause bronchiolitis, can cause primary and secondary pneumonias, and rarely some extra pulmonary manifestations. But I think my main point is absence of data does not equal absence of of influenza. So unless you're looking for it, you're not going to find it. Now, this I always say influenza is predictably unpredictable. But I never expected to see what happened in, in 2020 to 2021. So this is U.S. influenza circulation over the last seven years. You can see sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's A dominant, sometimes it's B dominant, but completely disappeared. And I'll show you a, another slide here that illustrates that in in um, early 2020 through about 2021. Uh, flu is now back for better or for worse, and we knew it would be, but but this was pretty remarkable that that influenza essentially disappeared. This looks at it in a bit of a different way because you can see that that some years um Influenza starts early, you know, may, may start in, in October. And that's exactly what happened this year. We had a very early peak. This is in the U S and most temperate climates. It's, it's a winter disease. Um, but here we see down here those couple years where we essentially had, had no influenza. And if you can look, it's hard to differentiate um, some of these these colors. Um, I think it's shown better in the next slide, the point that I'll make about, about 2020. But again, you can see the variability of when it starts, when it ends, how much disease it causes. Now, um, here's a bit about context. You know, in the United States, uh, except for the, the COVID years, uh, in influenza is the leading cause of vaccine preventable death in the United States. And that's different than many other countries. So this is going to influence our vaccine policy in a different way than in other countries. So you can see here 2019 to 2020, we had about uh, 199 pediatric deaths due to influenza. We know that these are underestimates because we know that not all are reported. Importantly, not all acute respiratory illness leading to death has a diagnostic. Um, and sometimes by the time the child comes in, the influenza is gone, even though it, it caused the disease or started the disease. Then you can see here, you know, one pediatric death in 2020 to 2021. Unfortunately, we're seeing pediatric deaths again this year, about 150 reported. Now, part of the problem is, this is the WHO surveillance system, who does influenza surveillance and who reports it. Uh, and as you can see here, the, the green, in the green are the countries that report to two different surveillance systems. In the yellow, there's, there's some reporting and in the, the gray color, there's really no reporting at all. So this map looks a lot better than it used to look. And, and some of that is the advantage of, of coronavirus surveillance, but we still have large swatches of, of the world with minimal surveillance or um, no surveillance at all. However, if we look globally, we see the, the same pattern that I showed you before, with influenza uh, essentially disappearing for about a, a year and a half. Now, the, the WHO has really pushed both for adult immunization programs, but also surveillance programs, and I won't talk a lot about this, but the integration of influenza and, and SARS-CoV-2 surveillance 
really from beginning to end that that this is a a costly process um you know it it's it's log- logistically can be difficult to do this respiratory surveillance so if you are going to do it let's do it for more than one disease and again we saw many countries do respiratory virus surveillance during the covid-19 pandemic who had not done it before and here's an example, messy slide here, but but the coronavirus reports, this is globally, are shown in, in red and the flu in, in blue. So this is just an example of both of these systems feeding into the WHO. And again, if I haven't made this point yet, you know, no flu here, but then flu flu coming back this year around the world. So I've showed you a lot of virus circulation, but that doesn't tell us who gets sick and what our influenza burden is. So so what is our influenza burden? Well, clearly it depends on the year. If, if you decided to study influenza during 2020 to 2021, uh, you would surmise that it's not an important disease and, and we don't need to worry about it at all. If you had looked at it in in 2019 to 2020, then your conclusion would be very different. So one of my messages, I know Jan says this all the time, you never do an influenza study for one year. You never do an influenza vaccine study for one year. It's really going to be much more helpful information if you look across several years. So recent annual estimates are about a billion cases a year, three to five million cases of, of severe illness. There are some variable estimates on deaths, uh, you know, de- depending on what methodology you use and, and who's looking at it, but 300 to 650,000 deaths a, a, a year. And again, highly variable. We see infection rates, I'll show you some of this, that are highest among children, and we believe that children play an important role in the spread of flu. Severe disease and death are most common at extremes of of age. Pregnant women do have higher morbidity, as Jan mentioned, and those with chronic conditions. And we acknowledge that most of these data come from high-resource settings. Now, this study um, that specifically looked at influenza-associated respiratory mortality, just a couple points I'd like to make in, in addition to what I said. Mortality uh, definitely in, increases with age, but this was interesting to me, the highest rates in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and those over 75. So again, a paucity of data for many years in sub-Saharan Africa, but perhaps a, a bigger problem than is recognized. Now, the group in, in South Africa are really, they were the leaders in, in coronavirus surveillance and, and, you know, really emerging as leaders in influenza surveillance and vaccination studies. And Cheryl Cohen just does some beautiful, beautiful work. And this is one of her papers in The Lancet where instead of saying when somebody has fever and cough, I'm going to test them for flu, she said, I'm going to start in a community and test everyone for flu at periodic intervals, whether they're sick or not sick. So this is a very intensive study, but we learn a lot from these sorts of studies. I just lost my slide here, which is okay, just letting people know. So what did what did Cheryl and, and her colleagues t- tell us? Well, as we've seen in other places, the rates of influenza infection and repeat infection are highest in children younger than five, But if you look over here, many of these are asymptomatic or what we call posse symptomatic. So very few symptoms. So, so children are getting flu and it's really just the top of the pyramid where we're getting severe disease or even clinically relevant disease. Um, that more symptoms and longer shedding duration were associated with increased transmission and, and higher load. And unfortunately, asymptomatic persons can transmit. So again, a lot of what we see with with the coronavirus. So what are the challenges that I've put forth to you so far? This is a constantly changing virus, multiple animal reservoirs, nonspecific clinical manifestations, unpredictable epidemiology and burden from year to year, and imperfect and underutilized diagnostic tests. So 
vaccination programs are going to be challenging. So let's look at the categories of vaccination. And obviously, I, I can't go into great detail, but in the white there, we have live attenuated vaccines that are, are, are licensed throughout the world, um, to, to uh, live attenuated influenza vaccines, but made by different manufacturers. And then on, on the yellow, you see what I call the non-replicating vaccines, which may be whole virus. It may be um, split virus vaccines. We have recombinant vaccines. We have adjuvanted vaccines. We have high-dose influenza vaccines. And all of the non-replicating, obviously the live attenuated vaccines are going to target the whole virus because they're the, the live attenuated virus. But the non-replicating vaccines target this um, head domain of the, the hemagglutinin there, and actually an, an immunodominant and very plastic domain. So the part of the virus that's constantly changing. So that's both good and bad. If you can get neutralizing antibody there, you're going to do very well at, at preventing infection and, and disease. But this is the exact part of the virus where we target that is rapidly changing. And then you have a stock domain, which is more conserved, but again, our immune response is targeted towards that non-conserved domain. So a bit of a problem, but important to know, most of our vaccines now are working up here. So what does this lead to? And this just shows influenza vaccine effectiveness in the U.S. over a 10-year period of time. Obviously, we had no flu in, in 2021. Um, and you can see it's what I would call moderate uh, effectiveness. You know, we hit a, a low there in, in 2014. Most years, you know, it's, it's about, uh, 50 to 60 percent. So, so moderate efficacy with these HA essentially based vaccines. And perhaps some additional efficacy against more severe disease, particularly in children. It's been a little bit harder to show in adults, but this really nice study looking at influenza vaccine effectiveness in, in children um, hospitalized in pediatric intensive care units of about 82%, and really a remarkable study showing effectiveness against pediatric deaths of about 65%. So, you know, Umesh asked the question, is, is the glass half empty or half full with these moderate vaccines? And to me, the question should really be, what's the size of the glass? Because it's, it's your burden that matters. And you heard this on Monday. You're going to hear this with malaria. You heard this with rotavirus. So even what they called, and I take issue with this, and this is even one of my colleagues here, low efficacy flu vaccines, maybe I would call them moderate. But either way, even low efficacy influenza vaccines can have significant public health impact because the disease is so common. And this is just some of, of their calculations for burden averted by, by vaccination. You know, 38 million flu illnesses, 400,000 hospitalizations, 22,000 deaths. You get the point. We absolutely want better influenza vaccines, but again, what we're doing with, with the current ones isn't so bad. So based on this and based on context, in the U.S., we have really created quite a market for influenza vaccines. We essentially recommend influenza vaccine for everyone six months and over who doesn't have contraindications. And because of the way the virus changes, we have to give this every year. We don't, the only place where we make a preferential vaccination for one group over another is in those 65 and over. We recommend enhanced vaccines, which would either be the adjuvant or the higher dose vaccines. So the high dose vaccines have 60 micrograms of hemagglutinin versus 15. The recombinant has 45. So if you're under 65, you get whatever vaccine is, is available. If you're 65 and over, we have a preferential recommendation. And here's um, just how we, we look at vaccination by age in the U.S. And just to highlight there, because this is new as of last year, the preferential recommendation. 
Now, what about the WHO? So there was a new position paper released about a year ago, May of 2022, where the WHO recommends the following target groups, not in order of priority, healthcare workers, older adults, individuals with comorbidities and underlying conditions, and as Jan discussed, pregnant women. For children, they ask us to consider the context. So children, young children, used to be among these bulleted priorities for WHO. This changed in 2022. And they say, depended on national disease goals, you can see their capacity, resources. Flu vaccine is not easy to get. Even in the U.S., we give it every year. In temperate climates, and and it's usually a seasonal circulation. In tropical and subtropical climates, you may be committing to year-round vaccination. And you have measles and you have malaria and you have many other killers of children. So this needs to be put in context. And if you look closely at the WHO influenza recommendations, you see they mirror pretty exactly the latest COVID-19 recommendations where we're looking at the high-risk groups, which are the older adults, the frontline health workers, pregnant women, and in, in children, primary series in children and adolescents could be considered based on country context. So flu and COVID from the WHO perspective are very similar. Now, this is a, a study that, that we published just at the beginning of the pandemic, because we were thinking, how in the world are we going to reach adults with all of these COVID-19 vaccines when most adult immunization programs shown in blue are in high-income and upper-middle-income countries and very few adult immunization programs in, in lower-income countries? And as you heard um, from Melanie last night, you know, we did pretty well. So we have to think about this in the reverse. Can we think about those programs we created for adults in many countries and then utilize them now to deliver other, other vaccines? So another part of that integration idea. So what about next generation influenza vaccines? Um, I've got about three minutes left. Obviously, we need better influenza vaccines. This will not be easy. And one reason I don't spend a lot of time on it is because at the moment, we, we don't have great data with these new vaccines, even though there's a lot of research and development in this area. So um, this is uh, the BARDA medical countermeasures, and I think it's a nice summary of where we could go with this. You know, we can look at better adjuvants. We can look at antigenically at advanced hemagglutinin vaccines. We can look at targeting that HA stem or stalk that's more conserved, but that involves tricking the immune system into targeting that region and not the immunodominant head region. You know, we can look more at T cells. We can look for mucosal delivery. If you look closely at this, again, looks a lot like Melanie's slide for second generation COVID vaccines. So it's not going to be easy. Um, it's not easy to look at novel influenza vaccines. We have a very well tolerated, long used, safe vaccine. And you're always going to be comparing it to the current vaccine. And if it's not based on HA, and we generally look at, at hemagglutinin and antibody for influenza vaccines, what, what are we going to do here? You know, there's a, a lot of other immunologic parameters we can look at, but, but we don't entirely understand what they're going to mean for protection. And um, the influenza universe in an mRNA vaccine, people got very excited with this recent study in, in Nature that looked at um, influenza vaccine in mice, where you can essentially use the mRNA technology and put every HA known to man. So they put 20 HAs in the, this single vaccine to cover all avian, all, all human. From a manufacturing standpoint, it would be great, right, to use mRNA vaccines. We wouldn't have to go through eggs. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have all of that. 
Um, but if you've been following the news, um, the, these vaccines, these mRNA influenza vaccines are delivering mixed results. And that may be more important for influenza than other mRNA vaccines, because again, we know these mRNA vaccines are more reactogenic. And so are, are people really going to tolerate if they don't get a lot of extra benefit? A, a more reactogenic vaccine when we have many that are already on the market. So uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't continue to look at these and develop these and they could have advantages, but I don't think they're the simple answer to our influenza problem. Um, and just to say that, you know, the World Health Organization has put a lot of time and thought into how do we have influenza vaccines that are more fit for purpose in low and middle income countries? I do want to emphasize in, in the last minute here, just that this was just before the pandemic. We clearly recognized that where you use influenza vaccine is tied to where there is influenza vaccine production and fill finish. And we said, if there's a flu pandemic, then the countries in blue that make flu vaccine are going to get it first. And that's exactly what happened with COVID, is that the countries with early rollout mirrored those with vaccine production capacity. So for both flu preparedness and COVID preparedness, we need um, more diverse manufacturing. So in summary, if, if you're in the U.S., you choose to use a lot of flu vaccine because it reduces illness. It keeps your workforce healthy. We've created this robust seasonal market where we can have different options for, for different ages. But we continue to try to make better vaccines. You know, if you're in a low resource setting, it, it's a little bit tougher um, calculation here. You know, you're really going to want to know, is it is it affecting severe disease? You might want to start by focusing on specific po populations. And again, it's not going to be easy. And at, at present, there's no Gavi financing. So that, that creates a problem. And just to say that every problem, and I won't say this, but I'll leave it up, that I'd outline for influenza, perhaps is also a problem with coronavirus. So um, lessons learned on both sides there. So thank you and happy to take questions. Why don't you select? Lots of hands. Um, I'm going to start in the back this time. The two that one of you go for yellow and then either one. Yeah. Uh, so my first question is, uh, why do you think there were no cases of influence in 2021? And the reason why I'm asking is we saw a different trend in India. We saw influenza cases up. And because of that, we launched a database, uh, a dashboard actually in the 27th week of 2021 and we have seen actually cases of influenza which is mostly of the uh, victoria type and h3n2 and it actually we saw it was coincidental and it actually guided us in sense when h3n2 peaked and fell uh, the next wave of covid was coming so and then we're like okay it's peaking and it's falling that means the next wave is coming and that actually told us but we don't have any evidence related to it so it's a totally different picture that i'm seeing here yeah, well, that's um, a wonderful information to have about India. As I've said, there were many places in the world that, that saw a different pattern. So I think there are many theories, and, and I can't claim to have the answer. In fact, I'm fairly puzzled by this. Initially, uh, we attributed it to the mitigation measures, right? We closed schools, we sent kids home, we wore masks, and, and that probably had to do with instead of having a nice curve, we saw this steep drop off in March in the U.S., and that probably was related to that. You know, people said maybe we're doing less surveillance. I think Jan would would agree and, and others that were part of these networks would agree we weren't doing less influenza surveillance in many places because we were coupling it with, with COVID surveillance, particularly early on before people had had home testing. So your data are very interesting and suggest, you know, is, is there competition between viruses in some way? Is there some innate immune response? What, what is going on here? So again, I would love to hear other theories. To me, 
the the mitigation measures aren't aren't entirely satisfactory because it, it explains what happens at the beginning, but it doesn't really explain what happens in the pattern you're describing or over the next year and a half. So I think we have a lot to learn. But flu came back, you know, and it came back with a vengeance in many places. We we had a bad flu season. Thank you very much. I was wondering about the um, recommendation in the U.S. to vaccinate healthy adults against uh, influenza. Do you there in the recommendation take into account the, the worries that exist about imprinting and um, reduced vaccine effectiveness and targeting your immunity to this, maybe the wrong strain that you'll need when you're actually at risk uh, years later? Yeah, so um, influenza immunity is complicated. And as I said, the coronavirologists are just getting a taste of it right now because they're saying, oh, we've had three or four vaccines and two infections. And I'm saying, you know, by the time you're 35 in the U.S., maybe, as you said, maybe you've had 12 vaccines and maybe you've had 12 infections. And it, it is really, really complicated to dissect out a, a lot of this information. And, and whether your imprinting might, might come from a vaccine, whether it might come from your, your first in, infection is hard to know. So, so what we've seen is there probably is some diminution of effectiveness for people who repeatedly get vaccines, and generally that's four or five years or more. But you still come out better than you do if you've had no vaccination. So you don't do as well as somebody getting vaccine for the first time, but you still do as well as if you didn't get vaccine at all. And the way I like to explain this to people is I wish influenza vaccines caused sterilizing immunity but they don't. So even if you're getting an influenza vaccine, you're still getting exposures, you're, you're still getting boosts. So there is a whole lot that we have left to understand about immunity. Um, but And in the U.S., we're, we're tracking this and, and following this. But again, at present, it still appears, even with repeated vaccination, the benefits may be better. Where we really want to think about this is in infants and young children. You know, we would love for their first exposure to be a live attenuated flu vaccine, but that's not licensed until two years of age. So that's where I think you really get into a conundrum of, of how are you affecting, particularly in the, in the youngest, the later immune responses. Okay, we'll go there. I think so. Uh, many people have, have tried to develop a universal flu vaccine, of course, focusing on the stalk region. Do you think that's a promising approach? Or are there other approaches? And, and what can we learn from the broadly protective coronavirus attempts? Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe coronavirus will help us learn about flu, because as I said, we haven't done particularly well with flu. You know, we're starting to work on our definitions a bit, too. I mean, if, if universal means every possible influenza vaccine, that's really a high bar. If we can get to, in general, more broadly reactive in influenza vaccines, I, I, I think we're, we're getting somewhere with, with this. So yes, there have been approaches looking at stem and stalk. I think it's one of the most common approaches being used right now for more broadly reactive vaccines. In fact, you'll probably see a, a, a press release that Duke threw a, an NIH contract that we're part of this contract, um, is going to start. It's an, an MR, it, an mRNA stock vaccine. So a stock delivered with an mRNA formulation, and we will see how that works. Again, you know, we get a, a, a little bit of a response, but, but here's the problem. These eight, at present, when we see these HA stem and stocks in early phase one trials, they do better against a broad range of antigens but they don't do as well against the matched HA antigen. And, and that's the problem. So are they going to be used in addition? Because because really, if you have a well-matched HA, you know, as we did early in 2009, we saw some very high effectiveness early on with, with those vaccines. So, so currently with these broadly reactive vaccines, it, it's a bit of a trade-off 
between very HA specific immunity and broader immunity? Do you want to respond to that or a whole new question? Because I want to be sure these people had their hands up. But it is maybe a combination because are you then looking now that you're vaccinating every year, whether you actually get more response to the stem? Where, because that's conserved in the, in the split vaccines, I guess. Yeah, so it's very interesting. So we are actually doing that. So, so one of the challenges that we've said is we're testing all of these stem and stock vaccines and we're measuring responses. But we actually don't have a database of what stem and stock responses are if you're repeatedly vaccinated or if you get, so, so we're looking right now, a, a, a woman in, in, um, my lab, my research group, Linda Colon, who focuses on HA STEM. We're getting as many samples. And if anyone would like to offer some from past influenza vaccines and control groups in pediatrics, in healthy adults, in older adults, and saying, what's our bar, right? What's the normal response to this? So then we, when we look at these new vaccines, we have a judge of if we're doing better or worse. Okay. I'm going to come back to the front here because I know you had your hand up. I see. You had to, okay, so we'll go here and then we'll look to the middle. Thank you for your presentation, Pamela from Cameroon. Uh, my question focuses on, on what you said about people 75 years and older uh, dying, especially from uh, the flu influenza in Africa. In my country, I don't know if there is any, there are any studies, especially around the Central African area because we really do not take the flu vaccine and we do not, I for one have never seen the data on how many people, how many cases we have for influenza. Usually uh, since the symptoms are so non-specific, we consider it to be common code and we really have a lot of episodes of, of children having uh, these symptoms during the year, which we don't know if it's common code or influenza, but really not um, a lot of cases of deaths happening in my country. So don't know if you have any particular data on this and what are your thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. And those two studies I showed you are modeling studies for the exact reasons that you've said is we don't have data in every country. So there's a lot of, of assumptions there. Um, certainly in, in South Africa and, and in higher income countries, we see this strong association of mortality with increasing age, which is also similar to, to coronavirus. And I would suspect in many of these countries, when an older person develops pneumonia, which is an uncommon and it wouldn't be an uncommon cause of death, um, there, there's no diagnostics on that. So I, I, do believe, again, the modeling suggests these trends overall, um, but in, in many, many countries, we have no specific data. Um, Angelique, um, did we see a change in the uh, flu virus during the period where there were no cases uh, between the time of the pandemic? Did it, the virus change the variant or it was the same that was circulating prior the pandemic and after? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the H3N2, which, which always changes, was a bit different. The others were the same. I, I don't know if I can go back to, um, to show that. But actually, it's a great question that I don't know the answer to at a molecular level, but it's a really great question, and I will try to find a better answer than my generic answer, which is really just based on were the changes enough that we had a strain change in the vaccine. Do you know? If somebody knows, please answer. Uh, not an answer to this question, a new question. Okay, go ahead. I was hoping someone would help me here. <laughs> Good um, question. So my question is about immunocompromised hosts, so particularly adults under the age of 65, and what strategies you would suggest to improve response. So, you know, any vaccine is better than no vaccine, but we saw with COVID we often gave additional doses. So can you elaborate? On Do you want to answer? Yeah. I, the world's expert. No, I'm not. <laughs> but, but I will actually present some of that data. The, the answer is more doses are better. We have the, the papers published. One of them in children just got published. And, and the high-dose content is better than the low-dose. 
high dose or cellular. So I think there's a lot of data coming out now. The issue is we were hampered in these studies because of COVID, but the study started four years ago so you in adults and children. Off label high dose. Well, well, it was not off label. It was a study with yeah. an FDA yeah. IND. So yeah. it was not off label, but we're hoping to change the label. So I'll talk briefly about it. Happy to show you data. Yeah, and that'll be great. The other thing is, even though we're talking about vaccines, I think Jam would agree with this too. We underutilize antivirals for for influenza. So we need to think about antivirals and immunocompromised. And also we need to think about people who are around the the immunocompromised. And and Kip emphasized this. You know, if you're in a nursing home, we are bringing you the the flu. You're, You're not going out and getting it. There was another hand in the back, and then we'll try to come here again. Thank you, Kathy. I have a question. Would you be able to comment on maybe thinking of changing the way how we deliver flu vaccines in order to increase coverage, like the use of microarray patches? I know there was a phase one trial on the flu map. What is your thinking around you know, the feasibility of that and the role of these technologies in increasing coverage? Yeah, I think influenza is a great prototype for for innovative um, delivery because, again, as I said, even in a place like like the U.S., it's very difficult to deliver it in the short period of time that we have between when the vaccine becomes available. And as we saw this year, you know, we had problems because we had an early influenza season. So it's certainly been shown that the more convenient you can make getting influenza vaccine, the, the higher your your coverage rates. And again, it, it's a we have a, a long safety record with, with this vaccine. So I think if you have any influence, it would be a great. I know measles is at the top of the list and there are a few others, typhoids on the list, but I think flu would be a great priority vaccine for that list. Thanks for a great talk. Um, maybe a bit uh, related to Angelique's um, question. Uh, we know that the B. Yamagata viruses are petering out. Um, and so I was wondering whether you had any hypothesis on why that's happened, or it seems to also uh, correlate with the pandemic, the, uh, the COVID pandemic. So do, are there currently any hypothesis on why that particular lineage is, is going away? Yeah, I don't know, again, that that I have a hypothesis. You know, the B viruses, as people probably know, uh, overall, our influenza vaccines aren't, aren't quite as immunogenic against those those viruses. And as you heard Melanie say, there are probably influences both from um, infection-induced immunity and vaccine-induced immunity on the evolution of of influenza viruses. Um, I, I don't have a great hypothesis for that. You can tell I'm not an evolutionary virologist. Emmanuel? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Kathy. Uh, so are there plans, uh, given that, uh, I mean, so influenza and then COVID, I mean, and especially looking at the elderly, so are there plans to combine these two so that they could be combined and, you know, so that that would ease kind of because they are likely to be annual vaccines both of them yeah thanks yeah great question and and one of the slides i had to remove but it's in your backup is just to show that we know you can give influenza and covid19 vaccines together so that's an important message when when we're trying to reach people you can co-administer and yes i think every influenza manufacturer that has access to a covid vaccine is working on combination vaccines absolutely